It's B-Movie Mania. Mania! Hello, B-Movie Maniacs. Jason Halls here. I thought it would be interesting to interview an indie filmmaker who's had some success in today's interesting and evolving cinematic landscape. I am sitting here with Tony Wash. Tony, thanks for doing this. Not a problem, Jason. Thanks for having me on the show. Okay, so I have a lot of questions for you. Um, hopefully I won't come off sounding too much like James Lipton if I just kind of fire him at you. No, not um, at all. Or, or maybe that would be good. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so what was there a particular time or event that led you into filmmaking? Uh, I mean, when I was a, a early teenager, I worked at a video store and and I kind of always wanted to make movies. I thought it'd be cool because I've been mm -hmm. a big fan of movies. Obviously, most people are. Um, and I don't know. I just like the idea of being able to visually storytell. And uh, so as I spent time working at the video store and kind of introducing myself to more films that, you know, the general public doesn't get to see or hear about, um, I really realized that there's just so much out there that it's not as difficult as you may think. Um, cause you don't necessarily have to go and make like a, you know, hundred million dollar, like Raiders of the Lost Ark. You can, you can make a movie like Evil Dead and, and, um, you know, still have it get out there and, and make a name for yourself that way. Um, so yeah, so that, that's pretty much where it, it incepted. And then I went to undergrad at a, a Monmouth college, which is in Illinois mm -hmm. and just a little school. And Oh, while I was going there, I, I did some small film projects and had a couple independent studies where I did things like video stuff, but it wasn't really anything serious. And uh, it wasn't until I went to Tom Savini Special Effects School a couple years after graduating college that I really said, you know what, I, this is something I want to do. I've been telling people for the last 15 years of my life that I want to be a horror director. Why am I not making movies? You know? Mm -hmm. Um because I'm not a I'm not a talker. I'm a doer. I've always been a doer, and so it's just something where I kind of said, you either need to shut up or you need to start moving, and uh, <laughs> so that's pretty much what happened. Nice. I'm glad you brought up uh, Tom Savini's school. I was going to ask you about that. Um, and the other one of the other co-hosts of of B Movie Mania had a question for you. He wanted to know what this is coming from Mike. He wanted to know what is the most important thing you learned from Tom Savini. Well, I didn't learn anything from Tom Savini. Let me just clarify that. And I have no problem saying that. I mean, Tom Savini, it's it's like anything where he puts his name on the school. And right. he kind of shows up, you know, maybe once every six or seven weeks and runs around with one of his props from one of his movies and, you know, talks to everybody. And, and it's cool. I mean, he's a nice guy and all, but um, most of the time. But, uh, you know, he just... It's more about having his name on the school than it is about him actually teaching. His his main instructor is this guy named Jerry Gurgley, who has an Emmy for I believe it's either Babylon Five or Buffy, and um, you know worked with I believe it was Optic Nerve for a long time, and you know was on a lot of his movies. I think he worked on Day of the Dead and. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and stuff pretty much in the 80s, the mid to late 80s with Tom. And so, you know, these are a lot of people that are kind of behind the scenes that you've never heard their name. Um, they're not as prolific as somebody like Tom Savini or Rob Bottin, but they're just as talented and just as hardworking, if not harder working. And uh, so they're the ones who really taught us everything that we, we found out about there. And, and I didn't, I don't feel like I really took a lot out of the special effects end of the school because as much mm -hmm. as I love um, doing, I, I like special effects and I love being an artist. Um, to me, filmmaking was always the bigger passion. And so I ultimately told myself, you know, why don't you, while you're here, utilize these people that you're hanging out with that are your friends and the supplies that you guys have access to and make a movie, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and it was originally supposed to be something that was going to be my way of, of showcasing all of our talent. Um, and then it just ended up, you know, becoming a movie and made me realize, all right, if you really do want to be a director, this is what it takes. And so I kind of just went that route. And I did some special effects stuff for a while, but I'm just not nearly as good at it as some people. Um, 
you know, one of the guys I went to school with is one of the head effects guys on Westworld and oh, wow. you know, has won, he won an Emmy for American Horror Story, I believe. And, you know, and then I've got my friends who I still work with to this day. And, you know, like my buddy Jason, who does all my effects work, he does clown from Slipknot's mask mm. for the last two albums. Now he's done his mask and it's like, these guys just have a talent for it that I don't have. Um, and, you know, sometimes practice makes perfect. But with something like a, a talent like that, you just can't really – you can get good at it, but you can't have a, a – a, you know, you, it's like being a virtuoso. Sure. Um, and I'm just not one of those people. So Now, these guys that you're currently working with um, – are you sort of all in the same region? I, we haven't really said, you know, sort of where you're positioned in the United States. <laughs> uh, I'm in, I'm out of the Chicago suburbs. Um, my special effects supervisor, Jason Kane, is also out of, uh, he lives in DeKalb. Okay. Um, which is west of the city quite a ways. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, it, it really all depends. The people that I work with uh, tend to be from the Midwest. It's kind of hard to you know, justify flying somebody from California or something all the way out here to work on a movie. And, and at this point, all of the films that I've produced and directed are, are local Midwestern, mm -hmm. um, productions. So and there's probably um, quite a few benefits to doing it that way. I mean, comfort and being able to, you know, location scout, that sort of thing, everything probably I would imagine just kind of comes together a little bit easier if you're sticking local. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. And, and especially when, you know, these movies don't have these extravagant budgets where everybody's getting paid, you know, thousands of dollars a week or even, you know, at all. Yeah. Um, you know, in many instances, I, I pretty much don't get paid on any of my projects because my belief is if I can't afford to pay people their, what their day rate should be, then I'm not going to take any money myself because you have to lead by example. Right. Um, and uh, I don't think there's enough people with integrity in this industry, especially at the independent level. Um, so, you know, it's it. I I think it works to our benefit and it works as a detriment. You know, you look at places like California, where obviously that is the hub of um, of the film industry, and so you have access to a plethora of people and um, and and stuff like that. And and I think it's that's almost a better place to be when you're marketing and selling your movie um, mm -hmm. as well as yourself. But the Midwest, it's like you talk to somebody in the Midwest and say, Hey, we're making a movie. Can we use your, your wood shop or I don't know why I came up with wood shop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how many, how many wood shops are there? Um, you know, or, or like, you know, we need to use this grocery store or, you know, whatever it is. And people are a lot more receptive to, making a movie because they're like wait a minute you're making a movie that's really sure. cool whereas yeah. in la it's like you have who's to not <laughs> yeah exactly they're yeah. like oh wait you're shooting another movie in front of my house when's this going to be done so i can get my car out of my driveway right or you when know? how much am i getting paid for my inconvenience or or whatever <laughs> exactly 100 percent. one of the movies that i recently just saw that you did was called the rake and uh that one just came out right yeah, it came out June fifth. So where was the location for that one? Uh, we shot most of it in Volo, Illinois, which is a, a small town um, close to the Wisconsin border. Uh, it's really well known for having this humongous uh, automobile museum. Okay. Um, and I don't know. It, I was just kind of looking through locations one night, and uh, my friend Nikki, who does a lot of my behind-the-scenes photography. Her and I both do a lot of late night stuff. And so like we'll text message each other while we're both working at three in the morning <laughs> and put like a shitty horror movie on YouTube or Netflix in the background and just bullshit about the movie. And um, we can swear on this podcast, right? Yeah, not a problem. Okay. Yes. All right, cool. I, I should always ask that first. I never yeah. do. No, if, I, uh, if, if we couldn't, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, right? No, it's funny because I always start going down the rabbit hole and then I'm like, oh, shit, maybe I should ask that first. <laughs> no, totally fine. Um, but but so anyway, so her and I were texting back and forth and watching, I don't know what we were watching at the time. It was probably something terrible like Rocktober Blood or something because <laughs> um, we have really bad taste. No, and, no. And she was just like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, well, I'm working on finding locations for the rake and I couldn't find a cool house that I wanted to, to – um, 
that I really wanted to check out. And so she started, she jumped online and within like 10 minutes, she sends me the link to this house and it was like serendipitous. Wow. Um, cool. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's typically how things I think work out with these, um, with these movies is that it's like, you'll, you'll be, you know, struggling to put something together. And then in the 11th hour, you're like, holy shit, this just happened to work out. And something and, works right. Yeah. And, and for being someone who I believe I was just telling my girlfriend earlier that I, I have terrible luck majority of the time. I feel <laughs> like when it comes to, to being on a set with a movie or during pre-production, I always have tremendous luck. Mm -hmm. Um, and things just always work out. And, and in that case, the location I think was perfect. Yeah. It looked um, great. Um, thanks. Yeah. Really, really picturesque. Um, that was one of the things that popped out at me because I, I can appreciate a, a movie because it, it doesn't take place, um, in very many locations. They're just kind of a couple key places. Um, and so I always noticed that, you know, as, as a filmmaker, I, I'm always looking at, you know, how to get the, how to get the story done, uh, in an efficient way. And especially like with the rake, it seemed really efficient use of location, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And, and that was the point. I mean, you know, part of making a movie cheap is not using a lot of locations and not having a big cast. Sure. And, and minimizing special effects if you're doing a horror film. Now, I clearly do not like minimizing special <laughs> effects. I have noticed. So, yeah. Um, because I, I, I pride myself and Scotchworthy prides itself on, on the use of practical special effects. A lot mm -hmm. of independent films do not, in my opinion, have quality special effects. And so that's something that I try and utilize to help propel Scotchworthy stuff um, to the next level to get us more attention. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's like, if I'm not going to sacrifice on the special effects, what can I sacrifice on? And it's multiple locations and multiple cast members. And so that's kind of how we generated that concept right off the bat. And um, then we also had that little 15 minute opening where, uh, where it's the two main characters as adults, it's them as children mm -hmm. in 1995. And when they're first introduced to this rake monster um, as children, and that was shot in Arlington Heights, um, okay. Illinois. But, uh, but yeah, ultimately it was just basically those two locations and some exteriors. Mm -hmm. um, but that main house that we shot in in Volo was just perfect because it was big. It was a sprawling ranch style house um, with like four bathrooms. So it really mm -hmm. did a great job of accommodating the cast and crew because at times, you know, we had 40 plus people on set. Mm -hmm. Um, it was on a wooded lot. So it was surrounded by trees and had a big forest behind it. So it gave us all the locations that we needed within walking distance of our primary production hub. So it was perfect. Yeah. And we should, uh, take a minute to actually talk about the mythology of the movie and, and sort of what it's about. Um, can you give us sort of the, the IMDB synopsis? Uh, so, well, the rake is a, is it's loosely based on a creepy pasta legend. Um, I was sitting with my buddy, Jason Kane, again, the effects supervisor. And since we're both big horror fans, we were just talking about stuff and we've been trying to get a feature length version of the muck together for some time now. And that kind of was seeming like it wasn't going to happen. Um, cause it would need a significant budget. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so he's like, well, screw it, man. Why don't we just do a movie about the rake? Uh, and he told me about this before. And I was kind of like, well, you know, tell me about it. And so he kind of showed me a story on creepypasta about it. And I was like, yeah, this is kind of cool. And I want to do a monster movie. So I started talking to some of my co-producers on it. Um, and we sat down and, you know, started generating outlines for it and everything. And, Basically, the rake is um, the rake to me is it's it's a pestilence. It's a life pestilence where it's like Candyman or Freddy Krueger, but it's not a person. It's not a a personality. It's it's a creature. So mm -hmm. it'd be like if you mixed Candyman with a werewolf almost. Okay. Okay. Um, or if the creature from the Black Lagoon could teleport, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> is kind of what I, is kind of how I considered it. Um, and so what it is, is you've got these two characters, Ben and Ashley, who are brother and sister and their father's a psychiatrist and is working with this, um, this patient who's, uh, just extremely violent and constantly talking about this rake creature that has quote unquote infected his life and 
uh, poisoned everything around him. And uh, so the dad's kind of researching this guy and working on this guy, and the guy escapes from the hospital and um, comes to their house and kills the parents. And uh, so now, and, and kind of has an encounter with a young Ben and Ashley when they're just children and kind of they now know about the rake and it kind of infects their life at this point. And now we fast forward to present day where they're now in their thirties and their foster sister is moving back to the Midwest from California with her husband because she's pregnant and she's starting a family and wants to be close to her family that she has left, which is just her foster brother and sister and so they all get together to kind of help you know move her into her house and and have a housewarming party and that's when she's going to kind of tell everybody about the fact that she's pregnant and this creature uh feeds off of happiness and life and youth and positivity and and anything good in the world and um so when it discovers that she's pregnant it has this this overwhelming need to feed off of the youth and the innocence of this life that's growing within her. And so now it ropes in their, their, um, you know, their foster sister who obviously knew about this entity as a child because they would talk about it and it clearly messed the two of them up a lot. Um, but you know, they, they then have, you know, encounters with this being, um, Mm -hmm. as adults during this weekend while they're all hanging out and kind of, unpacking the 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 house and whatnot and i mean i would recommend it i i had a really good time watching it i thought there was some some pretty great stuff in there um and you actually got distribution for this one right i mean this is you found on a variety of platforms um which is really cool so it's it's an it's easy to find yeah yeah i mean you can you can buy it on dvd at walmart which is really cool um it's released through sony pictures home entertainment uh, so that's great because they did get it everywhere. Um, like I said, Walmart for physical. You can order copies on Amazon. I believe it's on Amazon Prime. Um, you can watch it on iTunes. You can rent it at Family Video, like the only fam- uh, the only video store still around. <laughs> Somewhere uh, there's somebody sitting in that store who's going to watch it and maybe right? the next you. You never right? know. You never know. Well, that would be cool. I mean, I, and and that's been my thing. I've had plenty of kids come up to me at conventions and stuff and they buy my movies and it's awesome because as a kid, I never would have been able to, my parents wouldn't let me buy a, you know, it's my party and I'll die if I want to or anything (laughs) like that when I was a kid. Right. But I see them and I'm just like, you know, hopefully they are people like me where, um, this ends up being something that they think about and dream about doing and then they work towards it and, I mean, because I look at people like John Carpenter and I don't, I'm not even remotely comparing myself to John Carpenter because that's just, yeah, he's, (laughs) he's a God in my opinion. One of my favorites also. Yeah. So, I mean, well, and and really any horror fan, I mean, how can you be a a fan of horror movies and not like John Carpenter's work? Absolutely. Um, But so, you know, I look at him and, and, and I don't even know if he truly appreciates the fact that he's made such a impression on so many people. (laughs) Um, you know, not just entertainment wise, but also, you know, in terms of, of building, um, work, you know, I, yeah, I run a web series called world of death and, um, we collect short horror films from around the world. We have over 400 shorts from over 40 countries and majority of the filmmakers, when I have, I send everybody a Q and a for their episode so that people can watch the short film and get a little bio on the filmmaker. And I would be willing to say at least 70% of the filmmakers, when it says, who's the filmmaker you admire most, most of them put John Carpenter. That's so, what That would be my answer. Same here, and it's my answer too. And so it's like somebody like him, you look at it and it's like you've influenced thousands of, of artists. Yeah. And, and that to me is just, because not even just, in his respect, it's not even just directors and producers and screenwriters. He's also influenced composers. and Oh, for sure. You know, have you so. had a chance to see him tour with his music? Twice. Twice yeah. now, yeah. The last uh, I, years. I, another one of the, the co-hosts, Paul, said he saw him out in L.A. And he's like, if you ever get a chance, he's like, you absolutely cannot miss it. He's like, it's incredible. Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, it's cool because he's he's up on stage with his son mm-hmm. and with his, um, I don't remember if it's his stepson or if it's his godson. 
But it's like he's and and you know Carpenter is so surly because he's been fucked over so many times <laughs> in Hollywood yeah. that yeah. you're you're so accustomed to watching a Carpenter interview or listening to a commentary of his, and he's just like you know this is where I got fucked or whatever. I mean, for lack of a better way of right. putting it, sure. And and when he's on stage playing music, you can tell that it's just totally revitalized his enthusiasm for life and for his movies. Um, and and I, I I look at that and it's like this swan song that I almost wish that I would have at some point because um, you know producing and directing is not easy and uh, it's definitely taken its toll on me um, and I'm only 38 years old I look at a guy like Carpenter and it's like he he'd been doing it for 30 plus years you yeah. know. I can only imagine how much that's got to weigh on you stress wise and everything. So, well, I mean, if you don't mind, uh, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. What are some of the, the tolls and some of the stresses that you've had to go through? Oh, um, the well, darker side of things, right? <laughs> it's, well, I mean, yeah, no, no, totally. Yeah. I, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I think a lot of people more often than not try and hide that aspect because, you know, everybody wants to stay positive and cheery and be like, Oh, you know, I'm making movies. It's fucking great. And, <laughs> My Instagram and it is, is awesome. Mean, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, and it is awesome. I mean, it's to, to be able to sit in a theater with a, a you know, thousand people and watch something that you created. It's, it's unlike any feeling I, I can imagine anybody has. I mean, Sex might be better than that, but I th- I'd say that's about one of the only things that's better than that. Um, you know, I hope my mom doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> I don't know. Um, she might. Well, you know, I'm 30. Sorry, mom. I guess. Yeah. Sorry, mom. We'll, we'll edit that part virgin. out. I'll, I'll Jay but, edit that out. No, it's all good. But, uh, but see, yeah, you know, it's, I think that there's just something amazing about that, but when, when they say that the film industry is is one of the, if not the hardest industry to be successful, and they're not kidding, and, and now more so than ever, because, and I think that it almost flipped, you know, back in the day it was hard because you had to get access to equipment and, and all that in order to make a movie, but it's almost like if you made a movie back in the 80s or before, even in the 90s, you automatically were successful because you could get distribution because nobody made movies, mm-hmm. you know? Whereas nowadays, everybody's making a movie. So it's so difficult to get your stuff out there and have people notice it. And and even once they notice it, pay attention to when it's coming out or watch the trailer even. It's like, here's a trailer for my new horror movie. And they're like, great. Well, I've seen like 400 other new horror movie trailers come out today alone. So Mm -hmm. why am I going to watch yours? You know? So then you have to have some way of of appealing to these people and it's just difficult because if they don't understand that you have a reputation for high production value or um you know you have a a niche that you're going towards like uh you know my thing tends to be I, i try and be as period uh uh, with my work as possible meaning like a lot of my stuff i try and have you know 70s and 80s themes to it or even older um and a lot of independent films you know I don't feel like they have the budget or the um, maybe the patience to try and create period work. So like The Muck is an 80s movie, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, Skeletons in the Closet, which is my newest feature coming out that my team uh, put together that I definitely want to talk about a bit. Sure. um, Because I'm super excited about that. Uh, That takes place in 1986. And, you know, if it wasn't for one of my co-producers, uh, owning a house that he hasn't updated since 1979, <laughs> right. we wouldn't have been able to shoot that movie and make it take place in the eighties because how do you find a house that still looks like 1986? Well, you know, you, know, you sent me the, the, uh, the trailer for that. And that's one of the things I was wondering was, was how that production design came together. Cause it does. Yeah. I mean, it looks like 1986. It's great. Yeah. And, and that's part of, what I love about the house is that it makes me feel like I'm a kid again. You know, it, it even the layout of it is even very similar to my best friend's from my best friend's house from elementary school. So like when I walked into his house for the first time, I was like, holy shit, this is weird, you know? <laughs> um, it, but it's cool because it, it gave us the opportunity to, um, to, to shoot a movie there. And then, mm-hmm. you know, the other films in uh, Skeletons in the Closet, because it's an anthology film, but it's unlike any other anthology, the way that it's told. 
Um, but every, we were able to find other locations that also had an 80s or earlier feel to them. In one case, kind of a 60s, 50s feel. And so, um, you know, it, it's really all about the, having the patience and pre-production and development to, you know, to be able to, to do that. And, and luck, you know, finding a location again that ends up working perfectly for your production's needs. So Skeletons um, in the Closet, anthology film. Um, how long did that take? To, well, first, I, I suppose, what is it about? And then second part is, you know, how long did that take to put together something like that? So Skeletons in the Closet is, I'm calling it an 80s horror experience. So because it's it's not just an anthology. Um, most anthologies like Creep Show or VHS or any of those, they go in and out of each story. You, you know, you have a wraparound piece that's typically just, a, you know, a, an intro type of thing. There's not much to that story. And then you go into a story and then after 15, 20 minutes, you leave that one and then go into a new story. Whereas in Skeletons in the Closet, what Skeletons in the Closet is, is it's a show that's basically uh, Elvira meets Tales from the Crypt. Okay. okay. Um, the Widow which is played fashionably uh, well by our, the amazing Ellie Church, um, is a witch, as I'm calling her, who has murdered her husband, Charlie, by poisoning him. And she keeps his dead body in the basement, kind of like Norman Bates. <laughs> and every week she rents a videotape from the video store, goes down to the basement and watches a movie with him. And they talk about the movie. And so it's kind of like the Crypt Keeper having a conversation with Elvira. Nice. Um, but since she murdered him and now has him essentially in an eternity of hanging out with his murderer, um, they have a relationship very much so like Peg and Al Bundy from Married <laughs> with Children. Um, okay. <laughs> so it's it's a lot of fun because they have a really cool dynamic and my friend Johnny who wrote the script with me uh, is an incredibly sarcastic and funny person so his script is just exceptional in the humor uh, department as far as I'm concerned and um, and so what they're doing is now they're watching the movie Chop Shop on their on their show on the episode and Chop Shop is a is an anthology film that my co-director Ben Lewandowski and I had started back in 2012, where Ben had contacted me and said, hey, I wanna do an anthology. This is back when the first VHS came out and you know it, anthologies were becoming popular again. And he's like, I wanna get a group of independent um, horror filmmakers from the Midwest together and have each of us shoot a short film and then put them all together and release a feature length anthology and everybody pays for their own short but you're basically spending you know anywhere from five hundred dollars to ten thousand dollars to make a short film and now you're a part of a feature which yeah. has more marketability and it's a good idea yeah and and so i and and at this point now thousands of people have done that but mm -hmm. back in 2011 2012 when he incepted it no one had done that and so it, it ended up being this really great idea. I attached myself in it uh, right off the bat and went and made my short, which is called Grandma O'Malley's Pantry, and which is a story that I had written, shit, 10 years ago at this point. Mm -hmm. And I had always wanted to make it, and so this was a great opportunity. So he and I sat down, and, and we had two other filmmakers at the time, and we each did a short film. And after like two years of trying to figure out how we could get all of them to be cohesive as a story and stuff, we ultimately just disbanded Chop Shop. And Ben and I always kind of stayed in connection with each other and we're gonna put the two shorts out because they were like 50 minutes all together. And so we were gonna take our two shorts and, and release them as like a DVD or something. And I do a lot of the horror conventions. So, you know, you sell it for 10 bucks a copy on DVD and sure. people would buy it because they like my other stuff, whatever. Um, but so then we, we just kind of kept sitting on it and talking about what are we going to do with these movies? Like, we don't want to just release them and do that. And that's it. We want to do something more with them. And so we'd been tossing around different ideas of creating wraparound content to tie the two movies together. And so I had had this concept for the show skeletons in the closet years ago, at least 12, 13 years ago. Um, where it's this Elvira meets Crypt Keeper concept. And it was just like, well, why not make that the wraparound content 
for this because then all we really need is two people sitting on a couch in a basement watching <laughs> this sure? movie. Yeah. And so that's pretty much where um, it took me some time convincing everybody uh, to do it. But, you know, because at this point, it's like we've been sitting on these movies for four years, five years. You know, nothing's going to come of this. We just need to release them. And we finally said, nope, let's just do it and let's make it happen. And so we shot that in an, like two days, pretty much all the wraparound stuff with Ellie and, and, the, and Charlie, who's played by Adam Michaels, mm -hmm. who's a Chicago actor. Um, and then to add another tier to it, to make it even more interesting, uh, we incorporated the story of Jamie and her babysitter, Tina. And what that is, is Jamie is the widow and Charlie's number one fan. And she's this 10 year old precocious girl who every Friday night sits and watches skeletons in the closet in her family room. And she's the number one fan. And so this night in particular her parents are going out for the night and have brought over a new babysitter tina and tina is a typical you know female um high school student who is kind of bitchy and and you know <laughs> thinks that w that skeletons in the closet's really dorky mm -hmm. and so she basically spends the whole time making fun of the show which is not something you should do to the widow's number one fan <laughs> because you know if the widow went and poisoned her her husband you know, you can only imagine what her fans are capable of. Consequences, um, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. And um, and at the same time, if you see in the trailer, uh, there is also an escaped mental patient who's wandering the streets of Jamie and Tina's town and is outside of their house at one point. And so, you know, it's like we, we pretty much said, look, we want to have fun and make a movie that reminds us of what 80s horror movies were like and how much yeah. fun they were. People like you and I, when we were kids, this is what we grew up on and why we love the genre. Mm -hmm. So let's really tap into all of those tropes as much as we can and have fun with them. And, and so that's what we ended up doing with this movie. So you've got Chop Shop, which is an anthology film, being watched on Skeletons in the Closet, which is a TV show <laughs> that Jamie and Tina are watching on Friday night. So it's like a movie within a movie within a TV show within a movie. I was going to say, yeah, there's a lot of levels going on here. Yes. No, that sounds cool. So when are you looking to have that out? Well, we're premiering the trailer on Monday. Um, okay. What is that? August 6th, I think. Yeah. So um, by the time this comes out, we'll definitely have a link posted. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have the trailer released on Monday, August 6th. Um, so I'm really excited about that because I think the trailer is fun as hell. I think it really oh, yeah. shows people the possibilities with, you know, how much fun they're going to have watching the movie itself. Um, the movie at this point, our distributors are looking at releasing it this fall to coincide with Stranger Things coming back out and cool. obviously Halloween. Um, but at this point, Skeletons in the Closet as a whole is a concept for a television series um, where every episode would be um, the widow and Charlie watching a short film mm -hmm. and Jamie watching the episode of Skeletons in the Closet. And so it would basically be just further elaborating on the stories of, of these characters. Um, so that's a concept then, you're thinking about doing or is that's... It's a concept that we're trying to get produced at this point okay. so if there's any investors listening to be movie mania <laughs> hit me up there could be so yeah so so that's where like i you know right now uh shutter just announced that they're doing creep show uh, an anthology series on shutter with greg nicotero and i know that there's other stuff that is coming out that's similar to that mm -hmm. and so it's like this is the perfect time for a group of producers to look at this and say skeletons in the closet is a great concept all we need is a little bit of time and money and we can make a really cool show with this that isn't just like creep show or you know even tales from the crypt where yeah you like your crypt keeper but that's because crypt keeper was a character you never spent more than what a minute with him each right. episode right whereas with skeletons in the closet you're spending time with jamie as well as the widow and charlie and their stories develop you know they don't just talk about the episode and that's it you know you actually get more out of it like the widow and charlie is basically the elvira crypt keeper scenario but mm -hmm. with jamie i want to actually develop her family so it'd be like any 80s sitcom like alf or give me a break or yeah. married with children and 
so you get to know her family members and the idea would be that they're kind of like the the burbs they're like the the serial killers that moved in at the end of the right. street you know <laughs> well you so. know and something that could be interesting too um and i i suppose this would ultimately it would just still take a budget but um you know amazon video direct you know for content creators like us um you can put your own series on amazon which uh you know could be an interesting route to take with this um you know, uh, then again, it comes back to just the ability to market it and get people to notice it. And maybe without major distribution, that might be difficult. I don't know. But um, yeah, yeah no. I found Amazon's a very um, interesting route. I haven't really looked into it all that much. I should try and get my older films up there, but I just absolutely you, know. you have nothing to lose. So Skeletons in the Closet um, has distribution. We have a distributor. Yeah. So, okay, so when when you have the film done, be it the rake, be it skeletons in the closet, what's that process like? Like, what's that step for you where you say, okay, this thing is done, now we got to start reaching out to people to get this distributed? What was that process like? Uh, well, with, with the rake, we had a group of, of producers from Los Angeles contact us um, through uh, an actor that we ended up casting in the movie who works with them. Um, who had worked with one of my co-producers in the past. And so they kind of saw the muck and read the script to the rake and were like, you know, this is really cool. We want to help you get it out there more and get you some named actors. And that's how we got Shanae Grimes Beach and um, okay. and Rachel Melvin attached to it. And um, so they kind of took control of all that. Like we really didn't have a hand in, in anything in post-production from editing the movie to... Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so like we we pretty much shot the movie and then handed it over to them and they edited it and 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 distributed it and everything. So I don't really know any of the details of any of that. Okay. Um, you know, and uh but obviously it's out there, so that's cool. <laughs> sure. Um with with uh Skeletons in the Closet, um one of my co-producers Sarah Sharp who I've worked with on a number of films over the last 6 years. She had been talking to this distribution company in Chicago regarding another film that she's producing and found out that they're rebranding their company and want to start tapping more into the horror genre in particular and asked her if she knew of any independent horror films. And she's like, well, I just so happened to, you know, have this movie Skeletons in the Closet and... Uh, it was really cool. You know, they they jumped on and, and watched the trailer and some footage from it. And they said, they basically told her, they're like, this is the best horror content that we've seen come across our desk, you know, ever. And so they're, they're, they were very eager to, to find out what it would take to become involved with helping distribute it. And um, Nice. You know, so that enthusiasm is really, really awesome to have um, from the people who are coming on. Because I've just had so many terrible experiences with distribution and I feel like most independent filmmakers have yeah. um, that I actually feel good about this one. I feel like there's an opportunity here for us to actually make a little bit of our budget back mm -hmm. and um, you know, and maybe even get a little money for ourselves. Cause Hey, <laughs> ultimately that, that would be nice. It's yeah, that is kind of a goal there. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. We got to talk a little bit here also about your film, High on the Hog. Hell yeah. Where's that one at? So High on the Hog is the same thing. It is currently in the process of um, being delivered to the distributor. So we are actually, yeah, I believe it's being uploaded as we speak to the distributor, which is awesome. Um, and I really don't have any details on, on anything regarding specifics like they're hoping to get it released this fall mm -hmm. um i know that their initial goal is to do some small theatrical distribution they want to try and premiere it in la and then do some i guess a theatrical run in la um i know that my executive producer kevin lockhart has um the opportunity part of his distribution deal was to be able to um actually show the movie wherever and whenever he wants and so I know that he's going to kind of do a little bit of like a road tour with it. Nice. Uh, that's at least the goal, which I think will be awesome. Um, we want to do drive-in theaters and, you know, <laughs> um, the movie's about smoking weed. It's, yeah. it's all about, it's a grindhouse movie about smoking weed and, and, um, 
and fighting the man. And so <laughs> we want to take it to Colorado. And there's theaters in Colorado where you can actually smoke weed in the theater. And so oh, we want to screen it in places hit. like that. Yeah, yeah it would it would be it. a lot of fun. Um, um, and you've got some you've got some faces in that one too, right? Sid Haig and uh, Robert Zadar, right? Yeah, yeah, and Joe Estevez. Joe Estevez. I mean, we. Yeah, and, and obviously, I mean, you know, you know, God rest his soul, Robert Zadar, because he was a hell of a fun guy to work with. Um, and Joe Estevez is is such an awesome personality. Uh, you know, he's been in hundreds of films. That's mm-hmm. Martin Jean's brother. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, and I hate saying that because you know, it's that that's not his claim to fame. You know, he's he's been in so many movies um, that he's really kind of carved out a reputation for himself, but. But uh, but being able to say you're Charlie Sheen's uncle though is pretty interesting though. <laughs> <laughs> you have any anecdotes you can share with us about stories about working? No, with <laughs> honestly, they apparently don't have a. Uh, he apparently is not really a part of like the family. Like he doesn't really talk to any of them. Um, he actually wrote a book called Wiping Off the Sheen or Wiping Away the Sheen. Ah. Um, because apparently he doesn't get along very much with any of them. Okay. Um. So. Or even but, Robert uh, Zadar or uh or uh Sid Haig. I mean, um, working with those guys has to be interesting. Well, Sid Haig. Let me just tell you, Sid Haig is is a personality uh, that you just. Every time I've been, you know, I so we shot it. Uh, it's what am I thinking of here? Sorry, I'm talking about every movie in my head here. <laughs> we shot High on the Hog six years ago. We started shooting in August of 2012, so it was literally six years ago. Um, I was heading out to Galena, Illinois, for a month to shoot this movie. It ended up being one of the best experiences of my life. Um, but uh, you know, ever since then, I do I try and do all the local, at least Midwest conventions that Sid is at. And we'll sit and hang out at his table with him, or I'll have a Scotchworthy table or a World of Death table, and and you know we'll hang out with Sid at you know go to dinner and stuff. And I'll tell you, man, for being 79 years old now, he just does not stop rocking it, and he's <laughs> he's he's so good with his fans because you know a lot of these people you see at these conventions and they're assholes, and it's mm-hmm. like, dude, you have the opportunity to to for lack of a better term, exploit the fact that you are famous for whatever reason. And you don't, or you do, but you, but you don't respect the people who helped get you there. Yeah. And Sid is the exact opposite where he is very humble and he's always so gratifying to the people who come to his table and get his autograph and, and tell him how much they love his roles in all these movies that he's in. And, you know, the dude has a line every weekend, all weekend of people waiting to get his autograph and talk to him. And, you know, people come up and get his autograph every year. You know, they're like, hey, yeah. I saw you last year and I saw you two years ago. And, you know, how's it going? Tell me about the new movies and stuff. And um, so it's it's cool because I'd met him originally at a convention back in 2008 and was like, oh, I'd love to work with you one day. And then four years later being, you know, hired to direct a movie that he starred in, um, you know, prior to that, I'd worked with Tom Savini on It's My Party and I'll Die If I Want To. And, and that was cool. But since I'd gone to Savini school, it wasn't as it wasn't as much of a uh, starstruck moment for yeah. me as as working with with Sid on High in the Hog because I'm like, fuck, I got to tell this guy what to do, like <laughs> Sid what? Haig, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Like this is Sid Haig. Like this guy's been making movies with he made movies with Roger Corman for Christ's sake. Yeah, like I mean, you know, I mean that's that's fucking amazing. And um, let me tell you, talk about an amazing person to have as a part of your production we he and i got along so well together and he was so complimentary of my directing style and uh and and just of the cast and crew he he saw that it was an independent project and that everybody was there because they cared about it and they were passionate not because they were getting paid yeah five hundred dollar day day rate you know um and and that really uh i think developed his enthusiasm for the project beyond it just being another one of his independent films that he works on every year sure and uh and so it's actually he actually is producing high in the hog as well oh. and it's it's cool because it's the first movie that he's put his name above the title on huh. so it's sid Haig starring in high in the hog and that's the first movie that's ever done that nice um and it's 
so it's cool. I, I I always say he's like an uncle to me now. You know, he like called me on my birthday a couple of years ago and <laughs> left me this funny voicemail telling me about how old I am and shit. It's it's pretty funny. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah. So so working with him was was an incredible experience that um, I really wouldn't trade for anything. And I'm just so excited for the movie to finally be coming out because I feel like he's going to do a great job of helping promote it. Um, and and I think that it's got a lot of legs, you know, for being mm-hmm. an independent movie. I think it's a lot of fun. And the people that go to these conventions um, that I see, you know, these diehard horror fans, they're going to eat up High on the Hog because it is just batshit crazy. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah. it's And it's not a horror film. It's, it's a grindhouse movie. So, um, you know, it's action. It's a drug movie. It's a crime movie. It's a drama. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's got lots of action, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and even more sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And there is but, an X-rated trailer that we can post a link to as well. So yes. don't watch it at work. <laughs> yes. Watch it in the comfort of your own home, listeners. Yes. Um, but yeah, so we'll definitely be uh, keeping an eye out for that one, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. And that's the cool thing is, you know, 2018 it's, you know, you, you kind of asked me earlier and we, we almost kind of went on a tangent about kind of the trials and tribulations of being an independent filmmaker. One of the biggest things is just having the patience to, to get through the time it takes to get all these things out there, you Mm -hmm. know? And, and I, at this point from 2012 until now, I've produced and directed three movies skeletons in the closet high on the hog and the rake and it took until this year for all three of them to come out so imagine how how tiring and stressful it's been the last five years waiting for these movies to each come out Mm -hmm. you know and and so my only hope at this point is is that they they do something for the group because i i have been fortunate very fortunate to have surrounded myself with an amazing team of crew members and cast members on every one of my projects. Um, they wouldn't look or sound or feel even a millionth as well as they currently do because if, if those people wouldn't have been involved, you know, um, I'm one, one, one thousandth of, of the percent of what makes the projects that Scotch Worthy Productions produces, um, as cool as I think that they are. And, uh, and so, you know, and that sounds cocky, but I'm a fan of the genre. So, you know, if I don't make movies for people like me, then what's the fucking point? Right. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I have some sort of uh, rapid fire questions. If cool. you don't mind. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's um, do it. If there's one thing you think could make the film industry better, what would it be? I think the biggest thing would be just removing the hollywood element for lack of a better term from the industry as a whole you see the same four directors getting opportunity after opportunity to direct the the handful of horror movies that hollywood is releasing and i just feel like if if only they would take an hour's worth of time a week to go and look on the internet and find new horror filmmakers who are you know at whatever film festival or um, even just who has more views on YouTube or something. It's like there's such an, it's so easy with the internet to get out and find independent filmmakers that are doing stuff that's not mainstream and just reach out to them and say, hey, we want to give you the opportunity to make this movie. And and I understand that that having an, an untapped resource sometimes also means that it might be unbridled and it may be difficult to wrangle that person into you know listening to the rules and and having them do the things that you want them to do but ultimately with that also comes an unbridled amount of creativity and talent that that hasn't been utilized yet and the enthusiasm that comes along with a budget and people who believe in you is something that i can certainly say uh is unmatched um and there's a lot of projects out there that could definitely utilize that if uh if the producers or investors were smart enough to look into that respect. Uh, this one comes from the, uh, yet the other co-host of B movie mania, Chris, um, if you had a studio size budget, what would be your dream project? Well, why don't you give me a number here? 
because I want to put it into perspective for, for people out there listening. Okay. Um, I don't know. 30 million. Jesus Christ. $30 million. Yeah. What's like, like okay. you've got a lot of money. <laughs> if I had $30 million to make a movie, I wouldn't make a movie. I'd make 10 movies. <laughs> I'd make answer. 30 movies. That's Seriously. Because, because I mean, that's the thing is like, that's what pisses me off is you, you watch them shovel $500 million into, into Iron Man 74. And it's like, do we really need another Iron Man? I get it. If I had a franchise like Friday the 13th, I'd make a million of them. I'd make one every year mm-hmm. because you know it's going to make money. But but for me to say I need $30 million to make a movie is stupid. It's like I could make I could make a movie for a million dollars and pay everybody on the cast and crew a nice day rate, get a couple named actors to be involved, and still have a really good-looking movie and have the freedom to be able to make it. And, and that $30 million would... would would make us that many films. So that's what I would say. If if you had the opportunity to remake a classic horror film, which one would you pick? Night of the Creeps. Nice. Very yeah. nice. One of my favorites, actually. Very cool. What advice would you give to young filmmakers starting out? These people that you see at the conventions. Yeah. Um. Honestly, first of all, stop talking and just do it. You know, I know way too many people who are like, I want to make a movie. It's like, well, shut up and fucking make a movie. Mm-hmm. You know, you can do it with your phone at this point. I mean, there's there's iPhone movies that go to Sundance now. So just make a movie. Um, and be prepared to sacrifice everything to make it. You know, I'm 38 years old. I don't have a lot of money. Um, I I'm not married. I don't have kids. You know, I, it's, it's very difficult to, and I tell this all the time because everybody asks me that question and it's just, it's very difficult because I think too often people look at Hollywood and say, Oh, well, you know, I just want to be the next John Carpenter. I want to be the next Steven Spielberg. And it's like, well, fuck everybody wants to be, if I could have $150 million budgets like Steven Spielberg for all my movies, that'd be a dream come true. But that's not the point. That's not the case. You know, you you have to cut your teeth and, in this industry nowadays, it's even harder unless you have some sort of gimmick. So, so yeah, it's it's just it's tough. It's very very tough. All this gray hair in my beard here, and people, the audience <laughs> won't see it, right? Because there this is gray. A video I can podcast. attest. There's some gray in there. There's a lot of gray. It's like this whole patch here. My chin, <laughs> my chin used to have this beautiful flowing black locks of hair, and now it's just gray, <laughs> like a stormy afternoon. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so anyways, that's that's all from filmmaking. So, yeah. in my opinion. So, what is the vision for you and Scotchworthy in the future? The near future. I mean, honestly, like my 5-year plan, so to speak, yeah. would What's, be Where do you see yourself in 5 years? It's the it's the resume question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I what I'd like ideally, the ideal situation would be to find that that dream investor, you know, someone who says, "Look, I I love what you guys are doing and the fact that you've been producing content at, you know, the low budget range that you have dictates to me that you guys have the ability to make something phenomenal with a larger chunk of change. And so, you know, somebody comes along and says, we want to give you some money to make something, but we're going to let you maintain creative control. Cause that's one of the biggest things is somebody gives you money. They're going to steal it from you. Oh, yeah. And, and, and that's something that I'll never let happen to me again. And, and I'll never let, um, I, I don't want to have happen to any of my friends because it, it kills you. It, it really tears a piece out of your, out of your heart, mm-hmm. um, watching your baby get raised by somebody else, so to speak. Um, but that being said, you know, five years would be these movies come out. Um, the rake continues to do what it's doing. Uh, which in turn will hopefully help get a bigger audience for skeletons in the closet and high in the hog. And within the next year, I've got people saying, look, you've got three features out. They're all pretty cool. What's next? And then we get, I've got, I've got my two co-writers currently each working on, um, two different features that can be done for like the $500,000 budget range. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to get going next. And, uh, as well as obviously the TV series of skeletons in the closet. And then I have a couple other budgets, like again, the muck and the storm, which are bigger that if someone says, look, you know, screw 500 grand, let's go make a movie for two mil. Mm-hmm. Then I've got those ready to go as well. And it's, again, it's just a matter of the right person seeing what we're doing and saying, these guys have a cool thing. You can't, you can't, 
you can't work towards talent. Like I said earlier, you either have it or you don't have it. And I think that the people that I work with have an insane amount of talent. So all we need is someone to come along and say, these people are, are good at what they do and they work well together. So let's give them the opportunity and stay out of their hair so that they can do it. You know what I mean? Right. So, yeah, no, I think it definitely shows. And I think the people listening to this, if they go to our site and take a look at the links that we're posting to all these projects, I think they'll uh, probably agree. I hope so. Where can our listeners find out more about you and your company? Uh, scotchworthy.com. It's like a bottle of scotch and like worthy. We are not worthy, you know, but it's one word scotchworthy. Um, dot com. You can go there and that pretty much has links to everything on it. That also has a store page where you can pick up some of my older films and, uh, you know, you can, I should put a pre-order page up. I don't know why I haven't done that. Um, but you can, you know, you soon will be able to pre-order the new <laughs> movies. Um, and then, uh, you can, like I said, pick up the rake anywhere, really. If you go on Comcast or on iTunes or Amazon or Vudu, um, you can pick up the rake and rent it, or you can buy it. Um, and then, uh, again, Skeletons in the Closet and High in the Hog should be coming out later this year. Uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, as well as Scotchworthy Productions, but I tend to do most of my promoting through Tony Wash, uh, my personal page, just because I'm promoting myself as a director and producer, not my company. Right. Um, and then on Instagram, it's Scotchworthy. Um, so, yeah, those, I'd say those are probably the best places to go to, to get, uh, updates on everything. That's really all the questions I had. I, I appreciate you, uh, taking the time to do this and, uh, going in depth with all these things with us. Yeah, for sure, man. No, I appreciate having the opportunity to talk about it and promote it to an audience that, you know, may not know who I am or who my stuff is or what my stuff is. So, you know, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to help get our work out there more because a lot of people put a lot of time and, and effort into these movies and, and it's important to me that, that they all get the, um, you know, the acclaim that they deserve for their hard work. So thanks for helping getting out there. Cool, cool. Well, everyone, again, please go check out all of the links and uh, we will catch you later. <laughs> Listen up, maniacs. Do you have a question or a comment? Would you like to uh, send some bourbon to Uncle Lloydy? You can contact the gang on Facebook at B Movie Mania. You can also drop them a line at bmoviemania.com. Reach out, touch them. They are touching themselves, and they might just reach back. I'm Lloyd Kaufman saying, see you next time on B-Movie Mania. Woohoo!